Hello, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, empaths. I am so excited for today's show. We're going to be discussing my favorite topic with one of my favorite guests. Richard Webster is the best selling author of more than 100 books. He's written on topics from magic and psychic development to angels and spirit guides and everything in between. Hailing from New Zealand, Richard has appeared on television and radio programs all across the world, including Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. He travels and lectures widely and is just one of my favorite authors. He's on the show with us today to discuss his newest book, Archangels, How to Invoke and Work with Angelic Messengers. This book is so great, you guys. You're going to love it. It gives you a practical, hands-on guide for working with the angelic realm, including a detailed history of angels from across many cultures and religions. Richard, I'm just so happy to have you back on the show. I wanted to start by asking you if you've had an encounter with your guardian angel or an archangel. Yes, yes, I, I have. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me back. It's wonderful, wonderful to be back on your show again. Yes, my first experience per personally with angels occurred when I was about 25 years old. I, prior to that, I had a book importing business and uh, it went well for a while. I was able to sell the books to bookstore, bookstores, but it was incredibly hard to get them to pay me. Eventually, eventually uh, the business went under, it failed. And uh, I spent a few months working in a warehouse during the daytime, delivering donuts to places in the middle of the night, mowing lawns in the weekends, <laughs> doing all, everything I could to try and repay my debts. And it was um, a very unhappy time. And while I was working in the warehouse one day, I, I became aware of this little voice talking to me. I was concerned. I, th I thought I was developing mental problems or something, or something. But I gradually realized that it was my guardian angel talking to me. It made me realize that I was basically the architect of my own misfortunes. You know, I, I, I could have done things better. That, that helped me immensely and got me back on track again. So uh, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me, really, although it, it uh, appeared at probably the worst moment in my life, which I guess is when angels can appear and do appear. That's what I was just going to say. That is when when they appear is when we truly, truly need them. And, you know, I think a lot of people have had that experience that you have had and they either chose to ignore it, brushed it off as their imagination or just kind of kept plowing on. So what do you think? made you go, huh, th these aren't my thoughts. This isn't guidance coming from me. This is from a higher being. Yes, it, it was a realization that the, the words weren't coming from inside my head. They were, it was like a little voice right outside my ear or not whispering, but speaking very, very softly. And uh, once I realized, realized that, I started thinking, who could it be? And it was my guardian angel. And I, I agree, many, many people have had similar experiences I gave a series of um, lectures in a, a maximum security prison many, many years ago. And I, sp I spoke about the, the little voice that tells us, don't do that, don't do that. And uh, so many of the inmates said uh, they'd had that experience, but they'd ignored it. <laughs> Whereas um, <laughs> they didn't realize that it was a guardian angel saying, don't do that. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, I think that so many of us do that. I, I've had a lot of experiences, I believe, with an angelic being, but many times they've shown up as people in my life. Oh, you know? yes. Um, yes. I think yes. that can happen. I Listeners know my I grew up with a very uh, interesting mother that, <laughs> that I was very much afraid of. And when I was in high school, I snuck out of the house one night, went out with my friends. And when I was driving home, it started snowing. And I'm, I'm right in front of the driveway. We had a long, long driveway. And I'm right in front about to pull in and I careened and slipped into a snowbank. And there was no way I was going to be able to push my car out of the snowbank. And it was like two in the morning. And I thought, well, that's it, Samantha. You're going to be grounded for like the rest of your life. You know, when you're 17, everything is the end of the world. And I'm crying and I'm like, God, if there is ever a time I needed you, now is it. And I get out of the car and I'm trying to push it in vain. And out of nowhere, 
this very good looking man, about 20, comes walking down my neighborhood street. You know, my mom raised me to be very afraid of situations like this, right? But for some reason, I just instantly trusted him. And he said, do you need some help there, ma'am? And I said, yeah, I do. And he, with barely any pressure, pushed the car out of the snowbank. And I got up at the driveway and snuck back in the house. And she didn't know. Oh, wonderful. I like that was an angel. Yes, it was definitely an angel. And I'm sure if you turned around to thank him, he probably would not have been there. Would have just totally, been. totally not. And then the, the year later, okay, everybody, I'm not a bad driver, I promise. But I was driving and it was pouring rain and I, I slammed into a little rock wall on the side of the road and I couldn't move. The airbag had me trapped. And that same good look, he's so good looking. This young 20 year old man came out of nowhere and got me out of the car and went on his way. And I asked everyone in my neighborhood if they knew who this guy was. Nobody knew. My neighbors were like, maybe he's a boyfriend of, you know, a, a girl, but nobody knew who he was. So I feel like I've had a, a couple of encounters like that. So angels can show up as a voice, if, especially if you're clairaudient, but they, I feel like they can also show up as people. Oh, very, very much so. And uh, there's a quote in the Bible that uh, you should entertain strangers because they might, might be angels unawares. Unawares. Yes. I love that quote. I love it's that quote. Lovely, lovely quote. And, uh, Yes, I've met a few people who I think after, in, in retrospect, I think, my goodness, they were angels. The trouble is you don't really realize that at the time. Well, that was my next question. I think sometimes we can be angels for people. Like sometimes mm -hmm. you'll just have a thought like, I really need to go help so-and-so, or I need to call this person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our angels talking to us through us. I think so too. I've, I've, I wrote a book about an experience a friend of mine had. He also had a business reversal. He was had done very, very well, and his business collapsed, and his wife left him, and he went into a state of um, state of depression, and he was on his way to commit suicide, and it was a stormy night, and he was heading to uh, um, a pier going out out into the uh, the ocean, and uh, he passed a man on the street while he was walking to it, and the man smiled at him. He didn't say a word; he just smiled at him. And that smile was enough to make my friend turn around. And uh, wow. he's, he's since uh, we're, still, we're still good friends. He's uh, done very well since. But uh, he's, he's convinced it was an angel. Oh, that's such a beautiful story. You know, I'm, on my other, I have another podcast called Psychic Teachers. We actually did a whole show based on your book on pendulums, by the way. Oh, oh great. That's great. okay. I credited you every step of the way. <laughs> the magic of pendulums. I've always got my pendulum with me. Oh, look at it. Oh, that's beautiful. I love it. Was it. Made, made for me by a young, young friend from Germany. He spent, he spent a year in New Zealand as an exchange student when he was about 16, went back home, and three years later he came back to New Zealand for a, for a week or 10 days to see his old schoolmates. And he, he, spent, a, he spent a few days doing Maori carving, and he... That, that was the result of it. And he gave it to me. I was very, very touched. It's, it's greenstone, which is a New Zealand jade. It's believed to be lucky. So I wear it as a lucky charm. But it's, it also means I've got a pendulum with me everywhere I go. All the time. I love it. Well, on that episode, we were talking about angelic help and things like that. And then we did a show on grimoires. Mm -hmm. right after. And there was so much talk about angels in these old grimoires we were lo looking at. And one of the things I said to my friend, Deb, was angels used to be everywhere. Remember in the 1980s and 90s, you could not stop hearing about angels. There were books and there were TV shows and documentaries. And now I just feel like they're, they've gone away. You don't. And so when I saw that your book was coming out on archangels, that's why I emailed you right away. Cause I was like, oh, this is so exciting. Why do you think that is? Remember Joanne Webster Anderson and- one or a great, great book. I've got it right beside me here somewhere. Yes, yeah, I love her books. <laughs> yes. Well, I've, I've been busy writing books on angels for years. I've got um, th this will be my ninth book. These are these are all the well and books of mine on now. The just, spirit guides and um, angel guardians. I think I've read that three or four times. Yes. I cannot yes. recommend that enough to people because so few people give that much information about guides and angels. Mm -hmm. But have you noticed, like in the news, I feel like we used to hear stories. So-and-so, you know, was in the, uh, stuck in a, on a 
on a traffic accident on a highway and a man came out of nowhere and helped or so and so was in the hospital and someone came in and you know they said no nurse was on duty that must have been an angel why do you think we haven't been hearing those stories i'm not sure that if, uh, as you said the 80s and the 90s were the, were the the big years for all all of that it grew and grew and grew and grew and then it sort of faded i i think it's like a number of things uh, things become popular then they don't disappear but they just Get, disappear from sight a little bit, and then they come back. They come back again. Um, I wrote a series of books on feng shui back back in the day, and it it took Llewellyn's my publisher two years to publish the first one because they didn't think the topic was going to be, you know, very popular. And in the meantime, it was getting more and more and more popular, and I was getting worried I'd miss the wave. But I, I hit it perfectly, and then I wrote six more books on feng shui and. Um, that were my most successful years as a writer, I must admit, because those books sold so incredibly well. But you don't hear about it very much now. But, That's true. Uh, That's true. I've got a good friend who makes his living as a feng shui consultant, and uh, he's just as busy as he ever has been. So it's made no, made no difference, the fact that it's not in the, in the news. In the news. Well, I'm hoping that your book brings angels back in the news, because we need, we well, need, <laughs> we need this now more than ever. So you talk a lot in this book about the archangels and, you know, as a Catholic, I feel like I know pretty much a lot about the main guys, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> Michael and Gabriel and Raphael, because the book of Tobit is in the Catholic Bible. So I'm familiar with that story of Raphael healing. And, but the other angels, the archangels that you mention in this book are just, are just fantastic and such a plethora of information you also talk about Gabriel as being a woman, which is so very few people talk about her as being a woman. And yet I feel like the artists always portray her that way. Yes. Why did you use her to describe Gabriel? Uh, because my own experiences with, with Gabriel, uh, maybe we get, we'll, uh, we'll get time to describe the, the magic circle I do, I do and work with him. And uh, Gabriel always strikes me as a, a very, fa very feminine person. Uh, the angels can appear in any gender they wish or any shape or form they wish. Uh, in the past, uh, the first words angels said to humans were fear not. So they must have been great big enormous people who you know put terror in the minds of the whoever saw them. Now now and uh, now we often see them as little cuddly cuddly cherubs. We can see them as regular human beings. They they can appear. Then I think they normally nowadays appear in the form that will be accepted by the person and will not create fear because they're there to help. So, right. uh, so that they make themselves uh, approachable. And uh, Gabriel, to me, always has a feminine energy. It, it doesn't mean that it's um, f female because a lot of men have a sort of a feminine energy and a lot of women have a, a masculine energy. Uh, I used to be a stage hypnotist for many years and uh, there are two, two schools of stage hypnotists one is called the feminine ones because they they do it in a more gentle sort of way and i was that but then there are the other ones who are bombastic and commanding sleep sleep <laughs> and um, almost force force the subjects into hypnosis well for and, all we know they could be beyond gender well they, they are yes they're genderless yes they're, they're, yes that's a, that's a Mm -hmm. that's, a, I, that's a good way of putting it beyond gender yes i i like the idea though of including women you know in this category because it's you always see these strong masculine archangel michael types and it's nice to it's nice to see both sides included yeah in your book you do you have a lot i actually i printed them out so that i could walk through it step by step myself you have a lot of instructions i don't want to skip ahead in the book too much but i don't want to forget to talk about this because you tell people exactly how to do a magic circle to invoke the the archangels. But for us newbies on magic circles, there's a difference between invoking and evoking, correct? Yes. What you're talking about is invoking. Which is welcome, welcome inviting them. Got it. And, and what's evoking? Probably, probably more demand, more demanding. So, so it probably goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so tell people how you do your magic circle and communicate with the archangels. Okay, yes, I, I do this with the archangels, but I, I do it for any any 
mag magical purpose uh, as, as well. A magic circle, it's at least seven feet diameter. I, I start by facing east. That wasn't always easy, but nowadays every cell phone has got um, a compass in it, so it's easy, easy to face east. And uh, I draw a, a circle. Uh, I used to use a piece of rope that I could turn it, make into a circle. Uh, I sometimes use crystals. I've used candles. Um, in, in a, anything, anything will do, even small, small stones. Nowadays, I don't normally bother because I can just imagine. I know, I know exactly the size I need and I can just visualize it. I, th I face east. Well, once, once I've done that, um, I normally put a chair in the, in the middle, and that's because I'm getting on in years now, so I sometimes I need to sit down during it, but it's, it's, not, it's not actually necessary. Uh, if I'm doing it at home, I, I will have a shower or a bath first and put clean, loose-fitting clothes on. It need to be as comfortable as possible. If I'm doing it outdoors, oh, it's just whatever I happen to be wearing. Face east, and I visualize Archangel Raphael. And because um, Raphael that looks after the, the east, the east direction. And uh, I visualize him. I, I normally visualize him as a good looking man, probably aged about 40. He's holding a, a fish in one hand. This is because artists always depict him with fish because he healed Tobit's blindness using the gallbladder of a fish, of course. And he's got a big staff in the other hand. So he's uh, sort of regarded by travellers as a, someone who, who will look after them. And he is just a little bit taller than me, not very much. So he's the size, the size of, a, of, of, of a person. I tell people who've never done this before to do it with their eyes closed, because then sometimes it's easier to imagine it. But I can actually visualise Raphael. Once I can see him as clearly as possible, I then make a pentagram. A pentagram I use my first two fingers of my right hand and I make a pentagram in, fr in, fr in front of me. I bring my hand back and then push it forward through the pentagram. Um, th this relates to the lesser banishing ritual of the, uh, the Golden Dawn. Then I turn 90 degrees with my hand out and then I look at Archangel Michael or, or, or Michael. I, I call him Michael because the others are Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel. Mikhail, <laughs> having Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Michael doesn't sound, to yeah. me doesn't sound quite right. So I call him Mikhail. And I do the same thing. I, I imagine Mikhail as clearly as I can. I see him in chainmail. He's, he's God's warrior angel forever fighting the forces of evil. So he's got a sword. He's got one foot on a dragon, which represent, represents Satan. And uh, I visualize that as clearly as I can. Oh, he's also holding scales because he's going to weigh the souls on, on Judgment Day. <laughs> So uh, yeah. once I can visualize him or, or her, or I, I then do another pentagram, plunge my fingers through it again, move another 90 degrees, turn another 90 degrees. So I'm facing a Gabriel. I visualize a Gabriel as a, a woman with a very caring look on, uh, on her, her face. She doesn't look worried, but she just looks a little bit caring. Probably shouldn't talk too much about Gabriel. Gabriel is God's main messenger, of course. The archangels are all, all God's messengers, but um, Gabriel is the chief one, which is why it was Gabriel who went to tell Mary the news that she was going to give birth to Jesus. And there are other times in the Bible where it seems as if it was Gabriel, but it's, the angel's not mentioned by name. So uh, she's, she's God's main messenger, but she looks after people's hopes and dreams and aspirations as well. Once I visualize her, I do another pentagram. Then I turn to face north, which is Uriel. He's Archangel of the Earth, Archangel of Peace, Archangel of Prophecy, Archangel of Wisdom. They're, they're all busy. <laughs> they're all busy people. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I see him. He looks fairly stern. He's known as a flame of God. And uh, so I visualize him with a flame burning on one hand. When I can see him, I, I, I make another pentagram and then turn around. So I'm back where I started with Raphael. And that means I'm completely surrounded by the four archangels. I'm safe. I can do whatever I want to do in, inside. I'm now in the wonderful position to talk to any of the archangels if I want to. I can ask to speak to another angel. I, I can do any ritual. Um, it's very nice to talk to my guardian angel inside the circle, although I, I, I usually talk to my guardian angel when I'm walking, actually. When I'm out walking, that's when I mainly talk to my guardian angel. But it's nice to 
I, I, fi I find it's a very nice feeling to do anything inside that because the protection seems absolutely real. If I want additional spirituality, now I'm in the circle, I will visualize white light coming down and filling me and filling the circle. But uh, I can do anything I want inside the, the, the circle. Because you're protected. I'm and protected. I'll tell you, magical things happen when you do that. Now, I didn't, I never looked at it as a magical circle, but for years I've made a circle of crystals yes. and I always looked at it just because of, you know, my upbringing as a cross. So yes. I, I pictured, you know, the four angels making yes. a cross formation around mm -hmm. me, but I like your idea of extending the pentagram and doing the circle. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at it that way, but whenever I've taken the time to do that, because to do that, I feel takes time. You have to prepare you have to be physically clean, like you were saying, but you have to be spiritually clean too. And you have to have time in, in your home. You know, I mean, I have three kids and three pets. And so I need to find a time when I can do that and light my candles. And, and I always play like the Gregorian chants or have some type of music as well. But whenever I I've done that, I've always done it with a very important request. I don't do it for like, oh, let me have a good day today. I'll do it for healing or, you know, something that's very important to my heart. And I've never had a request in that circle that has not been granted. Mm -hmm. No, you need to have an intent of, of, yes, obviously. There's no, there's no point otherwise. Yes. But I think it needs to be a really serious intent, not I want oh, my boss yeah, to give yeah. me a, a raise. Like, I feel like it needs to be something, you know, kind of sacred. Yes. And when I've done that, I do feel them around me. I do. And it's funny that you said that about Uriel, because I always picture Michael here and Uriel there, and they're always very stern. And Raphael and Gabriel are always like, come on, guys, let's all get along. Like, they're just much more friendlier. So yes. it's nice to have that, that validation. Mm -hmm. Now, do you feel that we can call on these angels for daily help as well? Because like I said, I have this Oh, I only need to like, I'll go to my guides for the daily stuff. Mm -hmm. I bother my spirit guide all the time. I annoy the crap out of him, but I feel like, you know, these archangels, they're dealing with COVID and the Ukraine and big stuff and that whatever that guy's doing in North Korea. So I always feel bad bothering them. Do you ever feel that way? Uh, I used to, but, um, Mikhail told me they can, they can be in numerous places all at the same time. I always tell people, Mikhail's the one people call on if they need help. I say, don't bother, Mikhail, if it's something you can resolve yourself or with your guardian angel. But if, if you're in desperate need of help, definitely, definitely call on him. I've had to do that a few times in my life, and he's always instantly, absolutely instantly been there and uh, solved yeah. the situation. I think his traditional pronunciation is Mikhail. I just always say Michael. It's so hard for me to not say that. Um, I've told this story on my other podcast, but I'll tell it quickly here. My uh, former husband was a police officer, and he tells the story that when he was nine years old or 10 years old, he just announced to his family, I'm going to be a police officer when I grow up. And when he went to bed that night, he fell asleep and he doesn't know if he woke up or was dreaming, but he says he saw Archangel Michael at the foot of his bed, huge and big and strong, big, big golden light. And he said, thank you for your decision. Henceforth, I will always protect you. So he just always felt that. So when, when he was on the uh, midnight shift, I got him an Archangel Michael medal. I had it blessed by our priest and I made him, you know, wear it every day. He is not a jewelry guy, but I'm like, nope, nope, you're wearing this and you're wearing your bulletproof vest too. And uh, anyway, one night he was, she was shot in the neck right above that bulletproof vest. And he, oh, he really shouldn't have lived. I mean, he was in a coma. It was really, really bad. And so that first night in the hospital, I remember the nurse came out and she handed me his wedding ring and the Archangel Michael medallion, and they were both covered in blood. And I... I wasn't sad in that moment. I was angry. And I started screaming at Archangel Michael in my head. And I was like, where were you? You promised to protect him. You know, where were you? And as I'm screaming in my head, my sister, my other sister rushes me out so I can cry and scream in, in privacy. And my older sister was in the hallway with the sea of police officers. And this nurse comes rushing down the hallway and says, who's related to the Faye family? Who's related to the Faye family? My older sister said, I am, I'm his sister-in-law. And the nurse held her hands and she says, I have to talk to you. Something, something miraculous happened in that operating room. 
And she said, I, I used to believe in God. I used to believe in everything. She said, I, I used to believe I was a healer and I gave that up years ago. And she said, but we're all standing around your brother-in-law and he just kept coding and, and we just thought we were going to lose him. And she said, I, I got this icy cold feeling that came over me and I got this feeling that just said pray. And she said, so I prayed to Archangel Michael because that was just always my go-to guy. And as soon as I prayed to him, I heard a voice outside my ear that said, put your hand on his forehead. And she's looking around the OR. She's like, it was chaotic, you know? And she's like, what? So she puts his, her hand on his forehead and she hears the head surgeon go, we got a pulse. And he lived. And so she said, I don't know what happened in there, but please tell your sister that I'm going to church on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> So I really think that for whatever reason, that awful situation had to happen. But I think Archangel Michael was there. I think he was protecting him. And I think he's the reason why he lived. Yes, I would, I would, I would agree. Yes. And so when you do ask for that protection, even if you're asking in a way that's yelling and screaming, at them, <laughs> I do think that they will step in, which is so wonderful. Now, some of these other archangels, I don't know as much about. Well, I do know Chamuel. I have I've always been told to pray to Chamuel for career help. But in your book, you say he's also for peace and unconditional love and forgiveness as well. That's particularly how I see him for forgiveness. So I, rec- I recommend I've recommended him to lots of people because forgiveness is so so vitally important, and we're doing it for ourselves, <laughs> not 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 so much for the other person, but it free it frees you. But people hang on to grievances. It's, it's like mindfulness in reverse. Instead of living in the present moment, they're living 20 or 30 years ago when someone did something bad to them and they're still hanging on to it. And they're missing out on today. They're missing, missing out on the present the present moment, which is all we have. Well, they say forgiveness is for giving you mm-hmm. peace, not yes. the other person. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. So Jamuel's the archangel I recommend for that. Okay, and I, then I, I always say angel or archangel because the angels don't care. The, the angels know what their duties and responsibilities are and they do them. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a human construct that. That's one of my questions I had for you too, because you talk a lot about the historical hierarchy of these angels. And oh my goodness, it's a hierarchy. Like there's an angel for a day of the week and for um, your sun sign and, you know, for planets and. And you do say that again and again in your book, like this is what, you know, so-and-so said or St. Augustine said, but the angels aren't, they're not into a hierarchy. No, they're not even into names either. You you know, everyone at my uh, contact your angels evenings, everyone wants to know their guardian angel's name. I meditate and, and find it for them, but the angels themselves don't care. If you just say, guardian angel, where are you? Your guardian angel will be there. <laughs> we'll just show up. I agree. Now, and then yeah. here's one we could all use, or at least I could. Haniel helps heal family of origin relationships. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yes, we all need help with that every now and again. <laughs> and then how do you say Macadil? Yes, that's right. Make a deal. Oh, I did it right. Okay. He's for love and magic. Yes, in the Elizabethan times, he was uh, inv- invoked constantly by, you know, Dr. John Dee was the, ma- was the main person, but there were lots and lots of other people practicing magic. And Macadil was very, very popular. And you mentioned in your book that John Dee said he saw, was it Uriel or Ariel by no, his no. castle? Yes, he, he, he did. He was working in his, um, in his office or study and uh, he saw a little cherub flying flying past and uh, he realized it was Uriel. Wow. I think that's so neat. I just, I love reading. I love, love, love reading about John D. Do you describe angels in your books for anything? Manifesting dreams, Casiel, the angel of karma. Oh, and then there's Azriel. I think he gets a bad rap because he's the angel of death, but you mentioned there's just beautiful aspects to him because he's not the angel of death. He he helps usher souls to the other side. Yes, no, he's had a bad, bad rep. Really. <laughs> and then for um, some of our listeners, Azariel is for mediumship and clairvoyance. And then there's Asmodel for patience and love. Now, I've read different things about Asmodel. I've read that he's an angel and that he kind of left the good gang. 
Yes, yes, I've heard that too. And I'm not too sure about the fallen angels and, and all, 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 all of that. All of that. I, th- I think someone had probably smoked a bit too much or something. <laughs> okay. With a lot of that. Esmodel uh, helps people who want quick results and helps them realise that right now, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. You just need to be patient. And Achaia is the other angel of patience. So there's the Archangel Barshiel for happy family, luck, and good fortune. That's a wonderful angel to pray to. Yes. You have a, a whole chapter in your book on calling on the angels through your dreams. And yes. our listeners are big, vivid dreamers. So could you talk about some tips people could use when they go to sleep tonight? Okay, yes. Well, when you're lying in bed waking, waiting for sleep, just tell yourself firmly, to, tonight I'm going to have a dream and I will communicate with you can name a specific angel or your guardian angel or just say i'm I'm going to communicate with angels tonight and just say that firmly i I say it three three times to myself and then i just let it go then i just drop off to sleep actually my normal way of going to sleep is just to lie in bed and think of the good things that have happened to me during the day because that means i always have a good night's sleep i never have nightmares or anything like that because i go to bed and i go to sleep in a very good state of mind because I'm always looking for good things to think to think about. And sometimes during the day, something will happen. I think, oh, I have to remember to say that tonight to myself. So I say, tonight I'm going to communicate with, say, Adnakiel. I say that three times firmly. And then I let that go and just re- relax, think about the good things that happened during the day and drift off to sleep. And then in the morning, this doesn't work too well if you wake up with, with an alarm clock. It's best if you do this when you wake up naturally. So the weekends are probably the best time to do this. And if you've got a young young children, it might be impossible to do this. Or if you have a, a dog who leaps on the bed, <laughs> the crack of a dawn. But if you wake up naturally, you will have and can remember a bit of the dream. Don't move, don't change position. Just lie as still as you can and recall as much of the dream as you possibly can. Once you've got as much as you possibly can, then get out of bed and record it. I, I write it down, but you can record it into your phone or just record it in some sort of way. And that effectively unlocks the dream. And then during the day, more ideas will come into your mind about the dream. And then later on, when you get time to sit down and eva- evaluate it, you, you can see the angels input the input and what the angels have, have said, because you'll have a, you'll have a clear memory memory of it. Something but, that I, helps me a lot, because I do have dogs who wake me up very, very early and, and it it bothers me because it, it inhibits my dream recall. So what I do is I will set my alarm an hour before I have to wake up and then I just turn it off and I fall back asleep. And in that hour, I will have very vivid dreams and remember them. So if, if anyone is like me where they're woken up by outside influences, that's one thing you can do that will really help you remember your dreams. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I've done that for lucid, for lucid dreaming. If you want to have a lucid dream, that, that works extremely well. Yeah, that wake to sleep method. Mm-hmm. And you you talk about all of, I'm telling you, your book is such a good hands-on guide. I mean, every chapter ends with an exercise or a guided meditation people can do to connect with their angels. And then you have whole chapters on how to do these different rituals to connect with your angels. And you have charts for, you know, invoking different angels on different days or what's best for your sign. Or so it's, it's really, all in here, which I absolutely love. Thank you. Do you think that some people, you know, I think about some of the difficult stuff going on in the world right now. And I wonder, you know, where's their angel? Do you ever think like that? Like, are they just not listening to their angel? What's going on there? No, they're just not listening to their angels. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I think most people go through life without ever communicating with the guardian angel who is there always and is always wanting to help and and guide and uh, when I go for my daily walk, I, I walk for about five minutes and then I will ask my guardian angel to join me or I'll, I'll ask for, I might want Raphael for a particular reason. I'll, I'll ask for an angel to join me. After about another minute, I've become aware that the angel is there. I don't I don't see the angel. I just become aware of his or her presence. And there, then we can discuss. I've, I've learned the hard way to discuss it silently rather than out and out. I do walk out in the country, but it's it's funny if I'm doing it out loud. I invariably encounter someone if I if I just do it silently. It doesn't matter if I see anyone or or, or don't, and uh, the answers appear just like the little voice outside my ear. And I I chat with my guardian angel if, if, every every day, and if if I can't go for my walk, I, I really really miss it. It's, yeah, uh, you feel it. 
We had a listener send us an email that really has stayed with me. And she was saying how she had a series of, you know, you just get in those bad luck cycles of life where just a lot of nonsense is heaped on you. And she was, she was really angry with her angels. And she was saying like, you know, Hey, where are you? You know, what's going on? And she had a dream that she was walking through an airport and her angel was right there next to her. And everyone in the airport, huge crowded airport, people coming and going, everyone, including her had earmuffs on. And he said, this is how all of you go through life. You, you shut yourself down from hearing us. And he showed her different things in her in her life in the last few months where he had tried to show her like, oh, don't do that or don't go there or you should say yes to this. And she had just ignored it because she had I think she called them spiritual earmuffs on. And she said, so that dream with my angel taught me to take my earmuffs off. And, and I think that's so true. And so if, if anyone takes anything away from this, besides reading your book, it's take a walk with your angels every day and see if yes. you can hear them. And leave your real earbuds or whatever it is. People are always listening to something when they're walking. They're, or they're on the phone while they're, while they're walking. I, I do take my phone with me just, just in case, but uh, hardly anyone knows my phone, my cell phone number. So uh, the chances of being me being interrupted are pretty, pretty rare. I think that there's also this balance, but I really do believe in destiny and I really do believe in free will. Yes. And, and I think that in life, some things are just meant to happen and not all of those things are good things. Mm -hmm. And our angels and our guides and our loved ones on the other side, unfortunately have to watch us go through these bad things because it's part of our soul plan for whatever yes. reason we set out for our soul growth. And they're still there, though, to help us get through those tough times. And I think that's where so many people start to lose faith in these angelic helpers, because they go through these tough times and they think, where the hell were you? Yes. And yet, if they were to walk with their angel every day, I think just like that old poem, Footprints in the Sand, I think they would realize that their angels were with them, but yes. they had to go through that difficult event. It was pre-planned. Yes, 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 I'd, I'd agree with that. And uh, you, you can gain access to some of your pre-planned knowledge because you're born into this lifetime with knowledge in your soul. Raphael is the angel to speak to about releasing some of that information if you require it. Oh, like accessing your Akashic records? Yes. I didn't know that. I always think of him as the healing person. He is the healing person. Uh, he also provides in energy and of course, energy is required for healing of all sorts, but you can use that energy for other purposes. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a huge amount on your plate and you're overtired, you can call on Raphael and he will give you enough additional energy, but he will also help unlock that what, what you came into this life with your plan of what you should be doing in this incarnation. That's really good information. I want to talk about Metatron for a minute. I did a meditation a couple of years ago to connect with Metatron and it was incredibly powerful. And it was filled with energy. So when you said energy, it reminded me of that. I really felt his presence and his energy around me and, and helping me. Who is Metatron? Was he really a human first? And, yes. and how can people work with him in their life? It was originally Enoch, the, the prophet, he was taken. The other example of someone who may well be a human who became a, an angel was uh, St. Francis of Assisi, who um, some people say, became an angel but angels were god created them on the first day of creation so they're able to help with the with the creation the angels are much much older than mankind they're special beings so it's unbelievably rare so Met metatron is probably the only ex example and he is hu he's absolutely huge apparently he could barely fit in the universe in the universe if you read read that read the records i haven't actually seen metatron but i, I i'm sure if if, if I saw him, he, he would bring himself back to a size that I could could relate relate to. He's incre incredibly powerful. You can call upon Metatron for any, any purpose at, at all. I see him like a sort of slightly distant uncle who has your well-being at heart and, and loves and cares for you, but doesn't really show it. So you've got to sort of break through a little, a, just a, just a, a little, a little bit. The meditation I did was visualizing Metatron's cube. Oh, yes. The mm -hmm. geometric shape. And I don't know why when I was doing the meditation, I kept seeing the violet flame inside of it. It just mm -hmm. kind of appeared there in my mind's eye. And as I breathed the, the Metatron's cube around me, I felt his presence behind me. And 
it was just the most powerful chakra cleansing <laughs> I've ever done. And it really helped release a lot of old stuff and fill me with really, really good energy. Now, you also talk a lot about the historical stories about angels, like you just mentioned with the prophet Enoch becoming Metatron. And you talked about St. Francis of Assisi a minute ago. And in your book, I think you said that he saw an angel give him the stigmata. Yes, he saw a, a seraphim, a, a, a seraph, which was one of the seraphim. And that's, um, if you believe in the hierarchy of angels, that's at the very, very top. They're the ones closest to God. They say that archangels name, and angels are at the bottom because they're the only ones that humans are able to, to see. So it's absolutely remarkable that he saw a, seraph, a seraph. And he was the first person ever to receive a stigmata. You know, there have been, right. been not many, but there are more than 100 cases, cases since. Quite I remarkable. It is remarkable, and it would make sense that he would that he would be an angel because he was such a special soul. As was Padre Pio, who also had the stigmata. I wouldn't be surprised if he was promoted to angel. <laughs> I don't know oh, how that I, works. I wouldn't either. No, he he was absolutely remarkable, and he's he's now a saint, of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. Talk about a certain energy. I pray to Padre Pio a lot and he has that same Metatron energy that you were just describing. Like very nice, but you know, yes, very much a rule very, follower. Very, Yes, he was a very gentle, gentle man. And he was persecuted by the Catholic Church for most of his life. He, they, didn't, they didn't really want him. They, well, I don't think they knew what to do with him. They're so hard on that miracle stuff. I got to see some of the Medjugorje visionaries speak They were when they were traveling in America. And they talked about some of the stuff they went through because the church still has not approved those sightings, which is, which is such a shame because so many miracles have come out of that. I know, I know. Yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't think the Vatican really knows what to do with this whole miracle stuff. So they just kind of try to, try to, I don't know, avoid it is not the right word, but they're very, very cautious before they say it. But if you read the accounts of Padre Pio, he saw angels and he says he saw the devil as well many, many times. Yes, yes that's right. And so a lot of people don't believe that there is a war going on between the good side and the not so good side, but I don't know. I think we live in a world of duality and I don't know why that wouldn't be echoed here, you know, as above, so below. Maybe there is a war going on over there and and here as well. Do you yeah. subscribe to that? I haven't actually thought of it in quite that terms, but uh, yes, I can't see why. I can't see why. It seems very logical to me. Now, tell us, because like I said, everybody, he has written the best book on connecting with your with your spirit guides. How can people tell the difference or really does it matter if their information that they're getting is coming from their guide or their angel? I don't think it matters at all. And as some people just seem to relate to their spirit guides more easily than they do with their guardian angel or other angels. And you're going to get the same good advice because mm -hmm. your spirit guides are there to, to help. And spirit guides don't necessarily last for a lifetime. If, if, you, if you suddenly become interested in beekeeping, for instance, you'd get a spirit guide who used to be a beekeeper and would give you the best advice you possibly could. But if you lost interest in the subject, that spirit guide would disappear and help help some, someone else. No, I, th I think it's just who, who you relate to. I've, I've got a good friend, Blair Robertson, who is a spirit medium. He speaks with spirit guides all the time, is an expert on that. I've had some connections with my spirit guides, but for some strange reason, it, I've always been drawn more towards angels. And it happened when I was very, very young, when, when I was, it must have been no older than eight, because we moved house when I, I turned nine. Uh, we, I, I went to an Anglican school, which would be an Episcopalian school, I guess, in, in, the, in the States. But we had very, very good friends who went to a Catholic school. And they were always talking about their guardian angel. And one day at school, I asked our part, the Padre, I said, um, how come my friends have got a guardian angel? Don't I have one? And uh, he, sa he said to me, uh, well, they're Catholics and they need a guardian angel. We, are, <laughs> we, we don't need one. <laughs> and uh, I, I sort of accepted the explanation, but I remember it. I, I remember it as vividly as if it happened yesterday. So I obviously knew something was wrong. Something was wrong there. <laughs> So that is such a fantastic answer. Yeah, we can we do, we do need a guardian angel. That is for sure. <laughs> but we all we all need a guardian angel. <laughs> we all do. That is so true. <laughs> well, 
you talk in your book a little bit about Lorna Brine, who has written Angels in My Hair and other books. Mm -hmm. She has such an, a fantastic connection with the angels. Literally. And if you no, it's it's remarkable. She sees them everywhere, and she sees God. She sees um, the archangels all the time. I think it's Raphael who's almost always with her, isn't it? I remember reading her book and going, "Hmm, really? I don't know." Like it was so hard to believe, and yet when you see her, when you hear her. It's impossible not to believe, you know, there's such an honesty and a purity that comes through her. I just, it makes me wonder, like, is she just closer to the angelic realm than the rest of us are? Are they always there for us? Do you know what I mean? Like, why can she see them all the time and other people can't? I don't know why that is, why that is the case. But when she was a child, people used to think that she was um, very, very backward. She was treated treated that way but she was leading a very rich life with the angels and she could see them everywhere she was obviously wise enough even then not to talk about them at, the, at that at that stage and she must have just developed a really 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 close connection with them because she sees them around everyone and uh, every, 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 everywhere I know which I love now I know you're a really great dad and you're very close to your kids growing up how did you teach your kids about the angels did you tell them to pray to their angels did you talk uh, to them about their guardian? Did you tell them you did? They did have a guardian angel. Yes, I did. I definitely did. Yes, I told them to pray with with their angels rather than to the angels. Mm. So, it's a good difference. Yes, yes. And um, I've I've got one son who is an atheist, and um, the, the, the other. Two. So it doesn't it doesn't always work, <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, he puts up with some of the things I, I say, and <laughs> some of the things he says. <laughs> you know, I, it's so hard when your kids differ from you that much. Mm -hmm. I taught English for over 15 years yes. and I picked up my youngest from school yesterday and I said, how was your day? And, and she said, I just hate my English class. I mean, we were all talking. I mean, once you learn grammar and pronouns, what's the point of English anymore? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I said, honey, just, just put a knife in my heart right now. Okay. <laughs> but I always tell my kids to, um, to always pray with their angels. And I always tell them that you have to ask for their, their help. They're not just going to show up. Now I do feel like they're always there, but I was always taught that because of the law of free will, you have to ask for their help. Do you believe that's true? Yes, yes, I do. They will step in in an emergency sometimes. You might, you might be pushed out of the way of a bus or something. It, it sometimes happens, but uh, not yes, you have to ask. Yeah, you have to ask. And I think people forget to ask. People get out of the habit of asking for help, and they're not really sure, especially if they are agnostic or they're maybe they've been hurt by their faith in their in their childhood. They feel uncomfortable asking. Yes. And so I hope if anything, this show is a reminder that our angels are out there and they are here for us. I've always been taught we have one guardian angel. I know other cultures teach different things. What, what do you ascribe to with that? Everyone's got at least one guardian angel, but some, some do, have, do have more. And I'm, I'm told that some people have as many as a dozen, but they're people who have been, are in this incarnation to do something really, really important. Mm -hmm. So that they have a lot of additional help, but I haven't seen any ev evidence of that. I am aware of people who have more than one, one guardian angel, but I think everyone has at least one. I do too. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm meditating on a person's energy, I'll see like a football huddle of angels around them. And I know if I see that they're going through a very difficult time. And yes. so that's always, I'll always say, if, if I see that in my mind's eye, I'll say, is there like this huge stress right now? And so I do think that extra angels, you know, gather around when we need them, when we're going through really sad or angry or stressful or hard times. But for the yeah. most part, I do think we have one main guardian angel who's with us from our first breath to yes. our last and beyond. And that's why you see so many angels around hospitals. Back in the 1970s, after I'd had this hard time, I, I, I sold printing machinery for a while, which was the worst possible job for me. I'm totally, totally unmechanical. But my boss was a very strange man. He was a very ruthless, hard businessman, but he donated generously to every charity. And we used to joke, the staff used to joke that he was buying his way into heaven. One day I was driving with him to an appointment and we passed a hospital and he said, look at the angels, look at all the beautiful angels. And I couldn't see, I couldn't see them, but he, he could. And uh, he was a man who 
never expressed any interest in the spiritual side, side of life at all. And yet he was able yeah, to see was. angels in, around hospitals. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that idea. You've been so generous with your time. Before I let you go, can you tell people about your Facebook page for connecting with angels? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. My, my Facebook page is called Contact Your Angels. Okay. And I go on there once or twice a week and I do angel card readings from it. I've, I've got a deck of playing cards uh, called Oracle. What is it called? Oracle, Oracle of the Angels. I should know. <laughs> Oracle of the Angels. And I use those cards. So I'm on there once or twice a week. And um, about once a month, I do an evening of healing with your angels. And um, that, that uh, I promote that on the Contact Your Angels site. Oh, perfect. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes and on our Facebook page as well. So if people are driving or exercising, they can't write that down. You can always just scroll down to the show notes and tell people your website. That's psychic.co.nz. You're in New Zealand. Yes, I'm in New Zealand. My Wikipedia page, and I don't know who does it, but they seem to know more about me than I do because... <laughs> Actually, they've missed a lot of books. I used to be a magician as well, a stage magician, and I've written books for magicians. And some of those are listed, and I don't really want them listed there, but they're up there. You know, I've heard you can appeal that or you can email them. I was listening to some famous actress on, um, I don't know, on some interview, and she was saying that they got her age wrong, and it bothered her so bad. <laughs> That she contacted Wikipedia and somehow she got them to, to correct her age. So maybe you can contact them. Maybe I should contact them. I was just so flattered to find that I've actually got one. <laughs> I know. I've heard that's like a big thing when you get your own Wikipedia page. Well, after a hundred books, Richard, you should. <laughs> yes. So everybody, the book is called Archangels. I will post the full title and a picture of it on our Facebook page. And like I said, I'll put links to all of it in the show notes. But I really, really hope that you guys check this book out, especially for us empaths, knowing and truly understanding and having confirmation that our angelic beings are right there with us. Every step of this journey is just so comforting and something we all need right now. And Richard's book is going to really show you how to connect with the angelic realm. So thank you, Richard, for coming back on the show. I hope it's not your last visit on here. And I can't, can't wait to read your next book because Lord knows, I, I'm sure you probably already started your newest work. Oh, it's, it's finished. It's, uh, it's a book on guardian angels. Get the heck out of here. You're amazing. It'll be out in February. In February. Okay. Well, then everybody, he's coming back on in February. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Everyone yeah. listening, please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light, and ask your angels for help. Take care, everyone.